This is John Sherwood here with johnsherwood.com where we try to fuel faith in the 21st century. And today I have the great pleasure of being able to speak to Marty Solomon from the Bama podcast. Most of you would know him uh, from, but also the president of Impact U, a college ministry throughout the United States. Marty, thank you so much for taking a few moments here to be with me today. Hey, it's just going to be great. I'm excited. Thanks for uh, asking me to be here. You got it. So uh, a little background uh, on how I got to know and meet Marty Solomon. So, um, you know, I heard some rumblings a couple years ago of this weird thing called Bima, Bama, Booma. Nobody knew how to say it right. I just heard, hey, there's this kind of podcast out there. And I heard this like really simple, very like no flashy post-production, you know, dudes just doing it in his closet type of recording. And uh, he was talking about the Bible and he was talking about the narrative and the meta narrative of scripture and going through, uh, you know, chapter by chapter, book by book, uh, exegeting and exposing this work of God. And I thought, wow, this is really neat. Wow, this is really strange. Wow, who is this guy? And so, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, people that introduced me to Marty were also saying the same thing. Who's this random dude, Marty Solomon, you know, and what's going on with his beard? It's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, and so uh, I got a chance to meet Marty in Atlanta uh, last year in 2019, where he was doing um, a workshop for a local church there. And I got a chance to talk with him for a few minutes. And uh, Marty, I was able to twist your arm into being willing to take a few minutes here with me to, to do this interview. And I'm super grateful. So thanks again. Uh, I know you've gone through a big transition here with your family. You've relocated and moved to Cincinnati. Uh, how's all that going? How are you guys doing in this transition? As far as we know, it's going good. It may hit us maybe maybe a little later. I've grown up in Idaho my whole life, never lived outside the the great state of Idaho. Living in northern Idaho for the last mm -hmm. 10 years was the furthest I had been away from home, which was southern Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so now to move across the country, the move went great. I mean, we moved in June, so right during the middle of all this pandemic stuff. And, right. And in some ways, it, it went super well because there was no distractions or anything to get in the way. And in other ways, it's been really difficult because how do you meet people and make friends when nobody's hanging out? And so it's been a weird mixed bag, but this is, it's been good. Like, yeah. I'm not sure we have a whole bunch of stuff we could complain about. Mm. And uh, we're, we're, we actually have it compared to so many of us, we're, we're very blessed. And, right. and it's been a good, we've been, we've been having a good time. And you mentioned the pandemic, like, because just what a strange time this is, 2020, you know, all throughout the world here in the United States, dealing with COVID-19, trying to figure out as Jesus' church, Jesus' bride, how do we intersect with people? How do we meet people? How do we love our neighbors practically? Is it by staying away from them? Is it by serving? Like, this has been a very unique time, I think, for the church to learn how to adapt and how to continue to be on mission and in alignment with Jesus and his kingdom in the midst of a, you know, rapidly changing cultural dynamic and reality. And so I'm sure that has affected even what you're doing. I know that you typically travel uh, to the Middle East and do Bible tours there. Uh, talk about that for a minute. I mean, how is that getting affected? Are you still traveling? Are you trying to do things remotely? What's going on there with that part of your ministry? Yeah, it got all canceled. This was supposed to be a trip year. We had two trips set up uh, to Israel. Um, we had our first low contact experiment, which was basically a no hiking version of our tour, which is not normal. And then we had our full contact Israel experience scheduled and they just ended up just getting canceled. We rescheduled the earlier one for later and they all just ended up getting canceled by the time we were done. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it's really, it's really hard to have our bearings right now with yeah. what's going on and what that looks like. We've re we're just, we're going to wait for the world to keep on. I mean, I don't think it's getting back to normal. I don't really think it's moving on. It's the world's going to keep developing and evolving like it always has. And right. we'll figure out what this looks like a year from now. But in 2022, we're going to try to get back into hmm. doing our trips. And we got three slated uh, for 2022. My family's going to hate me by the time we're done. <laughs> but we're going to try to make up for all the trips we canceled this year and, hmm. and head to Turkey and, and kind of try to do the whole, the whole thing in 2022. We'll see. Well, let's get this out on the top, right? So um, if somebody's interested in learning more about what you're doing, being able to find you on the magic of the interwebs, which obviously our world is continuing to rely more and more heavily on, or even join one of your tours, where do they go find Marty Solomon? Yeah, every, I mean, like the site that you would want to just go to for just about everything is bemadiscipleship.com, B-E-M-A, 
discipleship.com. And there's, I mean, our podcast is on there, links to our newsletter, which is how you can get informed with whatever we're doing or where I'm traveling or what kind of live streams we're doing. Mm -hmm. That newsletter you can sign up for there. Uh, and if we have trips, that's where we're going to announce the details is at the news tab. You can find discussion groups, like really anything Bema related, anything Marty Solomon related, uh, as far as our immediate ministry with Bema, you can find at the, at the website there. That's, that's where you want to go. Okay. Sounds good. You know, I know for some probably in, in my neck of the woods and some of my audience, they're hearing your voice right now. And they're like, I've heard this voice so much on this mysterious end of this audio podcast. And I just want to take a moment to try to fill in for Brent Billings. You know, this, this is Brent Billings with Marty Solomon and your Bama Discipleship Podcast. So for those of you who have never seen Marty's face, here you go, guys. This is him. It's is kind that? of making me nostalgic. I feel like I'm listening to the podcast right now. It's hard to engage right now because I just keep going back to that place in my brain. You so keep waiting to hear Brent's voice. Yes, show I'm like, up where, where, where's Brent? Where's his questions, Marty? Come on. Yeah. Thanks for infecting hey, all of our minds. We appreciate that. When I used to travel, I would get out of the rental car and people would say, where's your wife? And now I get out of the rental car and everybody goes, where's Brent? Where's and Brent? So that's yeah. a new chapter I've moved into. That's for sure. Well, tell Brent I said hi and I'm missing his voice and his audio in my left ear channel right now. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit, uh, Marty, about a discussion that I kind of broached with you when we got to meet in person last year. And that was, you know, um, we were talking about um, the Bema podcast and how that came about and, and sort of its history. And um, you were talking about how uh, you saw kind of a, a very noticeable spike in your audience growth and how Bema started to really um, get to more and more people and how that was kind of, uh, it seemed like not so much of a gradual slow process, but something that might've happened very rapidly. And we were kind of talking about that and why you thought that was. And, you know, I was asking something about well, why do you think this Bama podcast seems to be striking such a chord with people. You know, I know in circles that I'm in, um, it, it, like no one had ever heard of this. Like I mentioned earlier, who's Marty Solomon? What's a Bema? What is that? Like, and then all of a sudden, I don't hardly go anywhere or talk to anyone that doesn't know about Marty Solomon and the Bama podcast. So why is this striking such a chord from your perspective? Why do you think that um, the audience that you've been able to touch and to grow has really seemed to connect with what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's a that's a good question. It's probably unbelievably complex and and nuanced. And the audience we have is relatively diverse as a whole. Like, I haven't checked numbers in a long time. I try not to care a whole lot. But I mean, we probably are. We last time I checked, we had about seventy five thousand active listeners, mm. pushing eighty. I bet half, just under half of those are from the tradition that I'm a part of, the Restoration Movement, largely International Church of Christ. We, but the other half is like all over the map from like Greek Orthodox to Reformed to Baptist to like none. Like I'm not even a part of a church, that kind of a listener. Right. <clears throat> and I'm sure that the podcast influences people on all kinds of different levels depending on their context. Mm -hmm. um, for some, this podcast is, I mean, it's funny that you, you use my name because I'm, I'm really a nobody. I'm a hack um, with an internet connection and a microphone and a love for studying. And I, I often will joke, I'm the Robin Hood of theology. <laughs> like I love to steal from the academically rich and give it away to the academically poor and kind of bridge that gap because there's so much beautiful stuff that we typically don't know about or are taught about in our churches and how do we shorten that gap up and so for some it's just one of those unique spaces where they can consume and and hopefully it's never me because I'm not the source that you can quote on a paper I don't have enough letters after my name to really be anybody but I can hopefully teach us how to ask better questions mm -hmm. and where to look to find the people that we can quote for the papers that we they are the sources they are the experts I love to be kind of that middleman that go between that kind of rogue mm -hmm. presence but then for for a lot of these other listeners that I think you and I are so much more connected to. I think the thing that's striking a chord and really was the explosion in our, in our listener curve. Like there was a major like parabolic curve that took off mm -hmm. at one point. And I think that crowd 
it is because in a largely evangelical context that is really driven to reach the world and and proselytize. I don't mean that in a neg- uh, just a negative context. I mean that in its all of its context. It's beautiful, positive, negative context. This this desire to want to reach the world for Jesus, to to expand the kingdom, and that we get we're driven by this passion and this fire to produce, mm-hmm. and 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 we've been taught to love here's the system and here's this model and here's the bible and here's the dogma and here's the doctrine now go reach the world mm-hmm. and there's there's a counterweight there's a counterbalance to that of okay but the production is not where we find our value the production is not where we find our relationship with god the production is not where we find our salvation the production when you only have the one weight, everything kind of gets out of balance. And I think so many of the things that we talk about through the podcast kind of adds the counterbalance to that and goes, yes, like, yes, the kingdom of God is taken by explosive, <laughs> violent men. Uh, that's a bad translation out of Matthew, but, yeah. but dang it, like the kingdom of God is taken by explosive men. Right. Um, as the kingdom of God explodes, like don't lose that passion, don't lose right. that fire. Right. But we have a tendency in the Western world to attach our value and our worth and just everything that we find security in, we attach it to the wrong thing. Mm. And, and to be able to do that with, while diving deep into the, by doing deep dives into the scripture, something that those same listeners are very passionate about. Mm. I mean, that's, that's a great little one two punch because it's it's not just a shallow yeah. hey don't worry about production right right hey right. just take a break and rest man like it's <laughs> right. it's let's dive into the scriptures right, and let's right. talk about chiasms and jewish tradition and midrash and history and oh rest right. is rest is the treasure at the right. bottom of right. this pool wow so i think that's what works but i could be wrong and so you're talking about this tension, right? This counterweight, this counterbalance, and, and how for many, I think just the realization in and of itself that there is supposed to be a balance, there is supposed to be a tension, and that there has been something out of balance is in and of itself revelatory, right? And in some ways freeing, and also in some ways very anxiety producing, right? Because you realize like, whoa, maybe I have you know, not understood or grasp or, or live this in, in a way that's appropriate or best. Or, and, and so I've seen this emotional reaction all across the board to some of the stuff that you're producing. Everything from, wow, this is great to, oh my gosh, you know, am I really a Christian? You know, and I think what you talked about, about being a bridge builder and trying to kind of like bring from academia something that is that is accessible to those that are not in it right which is a challenging job and i think an important bridge to be built so thank you for what you're doing and i desire to pursue that same sort of endeavor but how would you respond to the listener who maybe is finding themselves somewhere on that emotional spectrum of reacting to this illuminating revelatory process in their own heart. And maybe it creates on one end, great joy and freedom and excitement and, and, and greater love and appreciation for God. And then on the other end, maybe it produces anxiety and fear and insecurity and um, you know, a a dissonance. Like how, how would you walk them through that? And maybe even some of your own experiences personally, as you've maybe experienced some of those types of times in your life and in your faith. The first thing I would do is I would talk about the deconstruction process. Like it's okay. Like deconstruction is a part of what we, whether we like to admit it or not, or whether we like the idea of deconstruction or not, it's a natural part of just human development on any level, including our spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. So the deconstruction process is very awkward. It's like spiritual puberty. Like, like it's very hard to like go through and accept. And we, I love you, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, so the fact that like this is totally normal and okay and you don't have to be scared of it is like just keep growing like grow up like you can't go backwards in your maturity just keep maturing and realize this isn't where it stops this isn't where it ends just keep moving but then 
as you're deconstructing, so much of the angst you're talking about comes from like our, especially as Westerners, almost all of us in a Western audience, and me as a Western, uh, as a teacher, uh, we want to resolve. We, th so that deconstruction produces a tension and everything about how we've been designed says, I want to resolve tension. I have to resolve tension. And, and oftentimes, to take that even further, that resolution to tension has been tied to salvation mm. and right relationship with God, mm. which is where, and it doesn't happen for everybody, but for many, like you're saying, am I even a Christian? Have I done it wrong? Which, which the irony of, am I doing it wrong? Is it, it, it's still sinking in. Like it's, it's still sinking in because that's exactly what we're deconstructing. Right. This concept of like at the root of all of this, what we're really trying to rewire and deconstruct is like 1600 years of Christian tradition that's rooted the story in badness, brokenness, depravity, sinfulness, and this relationship between God and sinful depravity. And we're trying to back up and deconstruct some of that and go, wait a minute, is that what the Bible's inspired intent is? Let's rethink who God is. Let's rethink who we are. Let's re-examine what the inspired conversation is coming out of the Bible about those things. Because when that deconstruction happens, it should do away with a lot of that angst. Because God is no longer sitting in that chair demanding that you get it right. Hmm. God is this God that has made this good creation and says, I just want you to join me in this Sabbath partnership and we keep like thinking we've got to do more. And that's the very thing Genesis will teach us. That's the very thing that causes everything to unravel is right. this, this conviction that we, we aren't enough that we have to. And so this deconstruction, hopefully it kind of is cyclical. It just kind of keeps talking mm -hmm. to itself mm -hmm. and deconstructs the deconstruction, if you will. So uh, this brings up for me so many questions, right? Because on one hand, I'm like, okay, so how do you remain in that tension? Um, I'm, think, I'm thinking of all of my TULIP acronyms, right? And like, how, how do you speak of and understand and live out this idea of total depravity, as you mentioned that terminology? Where does sin and disconnection and brokenness and all of that, how, where and how does it enter into that narrative? Because it's there, right? But how do we understand that more appropriately or deconstruct our understanding of that in a more appropriate and faithful way to the intent of the scriptures, which you talked about? And then also, even very practically, as we're going out, as you said, for some of us, a very sort of mission, uh, euangelion kind of proselytizing type of paradigm, as we're trying to go and make disciples, how do we do that, Marty? I mean, I'm hearing some of my listeners' ears just start ringing and go, wait a minute, didn't you just basically hamstring me in being able to go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to obey everything, if, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe some comments on that, right? Because I think that I'm trying to anticipate what are the, what are the questions that come when you're hearing some of this kind of thing for the first time? What would you say to that? John, I think you've just articulated some really, really important questions that usually don't get articulated and don't get asked and said and kind of sit behind everything and we don't even realize it. Um, and the answers to that are going to be, that's significant. Those are significant questions with really significant answers and really is the heart of what we're trying to get at. And yet we don't usually <laughs> talk about it up front. And it usually doesn't happen in the first few episodes. It happens over the course of a hundred episodes right. and a few sessions. And now all of a sudden we're like, now we've reframed and we've done some of the deconstruction. We went on this journey. So, so if you're just hearing Marty Solomon for the first time, don't <laughs> stop, push stop, go to Bama podcast, watch a hundred hours of his podcast, then come back and listen to what he's about to say. Absolutely. No, it's good. No, your questions are excellent. Um, because, uh, I'm trying to think of where your very first questions were. Oh, yes. So how do you live with this? Like sin and total the total depravity. So yes, when you couch the story in terms of the problem, when you start the story in Genesis 3, hmm. then 
A, you're starting the story too late, but no, we'll get to that in just a second. Like when you start the story in Genesis 3, the story becomes about a problem, a problem that has to be fixed. And the, and the story is about sin. And the problem is about getting sin out of you, which then means that the gospel becomes about sharing the message of how to get the sin. And, and your whole narrative is now shaped by right. a problem where you started your story and it's about the removal of sin rather than uh, if you start the story in, in Genesis 1, well, now it's about God's good creation and a good story and a, and a, whole, a whole creation of goodness. Right. And sin does enter the story. but It, takes it wasn't it, bad to begin with. Exactly. And now sin takes its proper place, hmm. which is later. Like two, it may only be two chapters, but it is two chapters later. Sin's now the intruder, but the story is not about the removal of sin. That would be a that'd be a that'd be a focus on the wrong thing. The story is about the restoration of goodness, right. and of course, that has to do with my own goodness and my own sin and my own brokenness. I'm a part of the larger creation that needs to be restored, but now the narrative has has changed, um, and there's sin some key. Becomes- if I can, so it's like sin and the brokenness becomes a spoke of the wheel rather than the hub of the wheel. And that Absolutely. hub of the wheel is about God's goodness and that goodness being restored, reconciled, refurbished, etc. Absolutely. And, and, and then there are some really key shifts theologically that we usually don't talk about directly, but you asked the question. So, so here we go. Um, when, when, you, when you look at like the story of the fall... Hmm. Jews don't even have an understanding of the fall. Like if you were to ask a Jew, like, what do you think about the fall? They would say the what? Right. The fall. They don't like, they would have no idea. That's a Christian construct because Augustine viewed the story of the fall as far as like what happened and how sin entered the world. Like that's what the story is. It's about Adam and Eve sinning, sin getting into the world. And now we're stained original sin, depraved. None of this, this, by the way, in the actual story. But would it be fair to say that maybe Augustine was influenced by Paul's writing, especially I'm thinking of Romans, and maybe that's how he he understood that early portion of the Genesis story? Absolutely. I think he probably looked at it like so many other Christians backwards. He also had a very biographical theology, which he is very unashamed about explaining when you read Augustine's work. Like this is about his own depravity, his own sexual immorality, his own, like he's seeing this through the lens of a, what I'm going to call a poor reading of Paul, an inaccurate reading of Paul and his own biography put together projected on the biblical narrative, and now we have grounded and founded Christian theology and some assumptions that maybe we want to reconsider. Not that they're all bad or we've been totally wrong, but just like consider the implications of starting the story too late. Where, so now on the other side, the Jew doesn't see, and and, and Marty, why does this matter what the Jew sees? The Jews aren't saved. Okay, (laughs) but it is a Jewish story. But wait, though, Jesus was a Jew, right? Exactly. And and your question was about discipleship. Yes. So all of this actually matters because you do have a Jewish rabbi with Jewish disciples in a Jewish context with a Jewish commission to a Jewish world that expands to the Gentiles. But this is all very, very relevant. When the Jew reads Genesis, they don't see a story of what happened and how sin entered the world. They see a story of why we sin. Right. This isn't a story about what happened. It's a story about what happens. Like Adam and Eve are, we are Adam and Eve. They are us. Like it's the story of humanity. Why do we sin in the first place? When you now put sin in its proper place in the story and ask the biblical question rather than the wrong question posed a thousand years later, when you ask the right question with sin in its proper place, now the narrative is about, okay, understand why we sin and why we disrupt shalom. Do I need Jesus? 110%. But, but Jesus now, now it's no longer about just a transaction on a cross that removes the sin. Right. It's about an entire way of living Right. And an invitation into a kingdom project. And now the euangelion is exactly what it was in the New Testament. 
repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Like it's this invitation to an entire way of living, the kingdom of heaven, live now. And so it does, it, it, it does, it shapes everything. And it, and it hopefully shapes it into something that more resembles what Jesus was up to. And so if I can, let me try to regurgitate and recapitulate what you're saying here in a way that makes sense to me and maybe hopefully connects with someone in the audience, right? Because we're talking about, as you mentioned, I think some really important things, but can kind of be below the surface and create dissonance and sort of vibrations, but we don't know they're there or they're not heavy enough that they get their attention. Going and making disciples, right? Following this Jewish rabbi on this Jewish mission that then goes out to the ends of the earth, which was a part of the narrative arc from the very beginning, even going back to Genesis, right? How do we do that if what I'm going to make isn't transactional, right? If making a disciple isn't transactional, i.e., you've been baptized and now you're a disciple and I can say I did it. And I have taught this theology, right? Of like, hey, have you ever made a disciple? How do you know? What does it mean to understand Jesus' commission? What did these guys understand when Jesus said, go and do this? They had to have some sort of reckoning of what he was asking them to do. They couldn't have just walked away going, well, I don't know. We'll just try some things and hopefully that's what he meant. You know, we've got to have some sort of understanding of what Jesus' intent was in making disciples. And what, what I have been teaching, and I would love your remarks on this, is that, well, yes, sin is a part of this story. Sin is a part of making disciples and the concept therein. Uh, but it's not transactional as though, for some of my audience, baptism removes the sin, therefore, bing, bada, boom, done, disciple made, moving on. But rather that making a disciple is an invitation, as it says in Mark 1, as Mark records, that his opening of his message there is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand or, or near. And at once he says, these guys threw down their nets and fall, and, you know, and there's this connection with this radical submission and surrender and devotion to this man because of the kingdom of God being near and how much more all encompassing that is more so than perhaps a transaction that for some of my audience thinks of as this transaction of water baptism. And so as I'm restating that, how would you respond? What am I understanding? What am I not as to what you're saying? And then in addition to that, um, that might really rock someone's world. You know, they might really feel like, well, what have I been doing this whole time? And then how would you speak to them in a pastoral shepherding kind of way? Yeah. Uh, first questions are easy. I think you've nailed it. Um, second questions where we can spend our time. Um, uh, I, I, here's the good news. Um, whatever we've been giving our time to isn't not a part of the process. It's absolutely a part of the process. You can't make a disciple without calling Jesus Lord. You can't, you can't have the lights turn on without opening your eyes. Like you can't have discipleship without those salvation moments, whatever you want to call that. Like there is this saved process. There is a once and ongoing. There, it's ha it happened. There was a moment where I got saved. That's very much in the New Testament. Like the lights came on for me mm. and my life was different and the Holy Spirit invaded my being mm. and started working through me. But then there's also a very obvious in your New Testament, I am being saved every day continually on this journey. So why do I say that? Because all this time and energy that we've spent bringing people to that moment, well, it wasn't wasted. I mean, that's a part of the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's a, that's a part of the Great Commission, baptizing them. But then there's the rest of it. And right. teaching them to obey all my commandments. And, and that's not just about moral obedience. Mm. That's about partnership. Mm. And, that, and to realize that as a part of make disciples includes all of it. Making disciples was not just the baptism portion. Right. And then the teaching is like to make sure you do that, like a PS, like an asterisk. No, making disciple was all of it. So it's the bringing them in, it's the baptism, it's the sharing the good news, but then it's everything else that comes after it, which will be the bulk of what we're called to do as the church, which is God's looking for partners. Right. Yeah. The and rest of the great community. Restoring this shalom. Yes, absolutely. Discipleship is about the partnership. Now, you can't have a partnership without an agreement to be the partner. That's what the 
That's what the beginning is. And it's an important beginning. So let us not do away with the baptism and the commitment to that in our tradition. But let's realize that discipleship is actually mostly about everything else. And we've kind of gotten it just a little bit backwards, I think. So I would say, yes, don't feel bad. Right. Like I've done it wrong all these years. Just realize that now we have a more complete, a more colorful, a more, a more accurate, and none of those things completely colorful, not completely accurate, right. not completely, because we're always going to be growing and developing. But just let those lights come on more and more and join the mission. That's an important anti-dogmatic point I want to underscore and highlight for everyone. Not completely colorful, not completely unfurled. We are all, you know, none of us have a lock or a corner on perfectly right doctrine and theology, but we're always continuing to try to grow for God's ways are much greater than ours. And so as I think about this from myself in my own context, as a pastor, as a church leader, as a disciple maker in the Southeastern United States, in the Bible belt, as we like to call it, right? I'm in a very Christianized, you know, I kind of air quote that Christianized environment and context. As you, as you talked about a, a, a Christian context, that's 2000 years byproduct of all of church history. And this conversation is something I find myself having a lot with folks. It's, it, I would say especially younger folks, but I think in general, I think this is generally representative, that some people have been living their lives um, in a Christian faith and worldview that uh, was uh, consistent with what they had, with what they had been given, with what they'd received, with what they understood to that point. And maybe it was lacking some of these um, what I might call kind of holistic concepts of discipleship, that, that Jesus' lordship, to say Jesus' lord means a complete surrender and submission of every area of my life, as opposed to maybe just the part of my life on Sunday morning when I go to church, or the part of my life that says, hey, I got saved, I made the transaction through a prayer or a baptism or whatever, and so I'm good to now go live the rest of my life under my own lordship. And I, as I present this gospel message, as, as I hope to be a, a more accurate and faithful representation of what the scriptures teach, I often see this response where there is this uh, just despair that what have I been doing this whole time? I've been utterly wrong and hating God. And in some cases, that might actually be kind of accurate, right? Like, yes, you really haven't actually had a love or appreciation for God. But at other times, maybe you have. And so how do you reconcile that, uh, I think especially emotionally, right? How do you reconcile all that has happened thus far, all the ways that God has loved you and you have recognized that, all the ways that you have tried to respond? How do you not negate that to meaninglessness now that there is a more full and complete picture of Jesus' call to your life that's coming? And so what I found myself is in this position of trying to pastorally help people walk through that, how to appreciate all that God has done in their life, how to validate their faithfulness up to this point, while not letting that cause them to not keep moving forward into this greater, more holistic, hopefully, and, and accurate presentation of what God is calling them into. How do you find yourself in your context dealing with that, helping people that have been in a very Christian context be open to this maybe fuller understanding of discipleship than what they've previously known while managing the, the emotional despair that can come with that, especially when there's sincerity, especially when they're sincere. Yeah. And one of the places I'm deficient in this is my feeler. I'm not a big, I, I hmm. uh, my therapist helps me understand my feeler because I, I struggle with my feeler. I dysfunctionally lean into my thinker because what I do, John, is I, I make it all abstract. And first of all, is I try to let us off the hook so we can show ourselves a bunch of grace. Like we haven't known a bunch of this stuff. Like mm -hmm. for the last 150 years, we've had two options, liberal textual criticism. And then the reaction to that, which is a more Christian fundamentalism out of which evangelicalism came. Mm -hmm. But then like in the last three, four decades, archeology span helped us understand a more accurate representation. So it wasn't just these two bifurcated and so now we're just, we're, we're our whole, it wasn't like we had all the tools and we decided to ignore them. No, God's been, God's been giving, and I want to trust that God's in that process. God's been giving us tools 
to help move and shape as people empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm just a part of, I'm swept up in the wave. I'm swept up in the stream. So, so A, give myself a ton of grace and a ton of, like we have to be good at giving ourselves grace. Like we just have to be experts. If I can't give myself grace, there is no way I'm giving grace to anybody else. Mm-hmm. There is no, I, I think I am, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to be able to live in grace first so I can give grace to everybody else, uh, an outpouring of. So there's that. Um, uh, there's uh, um, re-ask, the, re-ask your question in a way I can expand on that, John, because yeah. that's where my mind goes. I think I struggle because I, I, I struggle so much with being the feeler because there, here's what I have experienced. I have not experienced a, a, a wave of a multitude of people that need to be persuaded or convinced that there's more. Mm. I, I mean, I generally find Christians everywhere because we have eternity set in our hearts because, because we're tapped into the God conversation and we are at least intimate enough with God to know that we are missing pieces and color. And like there's stuff that, we are we are longing for it's not just depth but it's breadth and it's it's complexity and nuance and i'm not talking about theological details and academic data i'm talking about like i haven't found a whole bunch of people that need to be convinced i found people that are thirsty mm. hungry mm. and so when you when you invite and just in it's like i had a friend that did that that talked about i love this metaphor he said we have treated discipleship and and salvation so much like it's it's like getting through the gates of disneyland or disney world right Mm -hmm. so you walk through the gates but but our faith has looked like somebody that gets to the gates and just stands there like we don't know where to go and the gates are important. Like you got to, you know, whatever you want to, this metaphor breaks down quickly, but you got to pay the fee. You got to get in. It is you got to get in. But the whole point of the park is the park. And, right. and we're just like somebody starting to like, maybe Bema is somebody handing you a park map and going, look at all the rides. Look at all right, the right. stuff there. I'm really playing to our consumeristic mentality. Yeah, but you are. Yeah, you look, are. Yeah. Look at I all the- I want to go to the dragon ride, please. Yeah. It's the happiest place on earth. Um, <laughs> so uh, I feel like that's so much of, don't, don't have a despair about the fact that, like if that were a real metaphor, mm-hmm. and let's say you've stood at the gates now for three hours, you could just sit there and despair that you've wasted three hours of your time in the park. And for some people, it's like, I've wasted my whole life. I've wasted 50 years of faith. I get that. But here's a map. Why waste one second more? Just join the party. And God ain't taken, like, there's no quantity. God's not going to weigh your basket at the end of this. That's not how it works. So just join the party. Join the fun. Join the park. And 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 maybe that's a great place for us to kind of bring the plane in for a landing is that I think about so many of Jesus' metaphors in the Gospels for the kingdom of God being a banquet, being a party, that this party is open to all. And no matter whether you've, you know, spent your whole life, quote unquote, or 50 years, you know, standing at the door of the party, looking in, going, I don't know, am I worthy? Whatever he says, come in and eat, you know, and and I think about how for so many of us, this really does come down to being strong in the grace, as you mentioned, like giving grace to ourselves, uh, being willing to embrace God's graciousness to us, um, being willing to, to, to stand there at the gates of that, of that amusement park, if we want to continue that theme, whether it's been three hours or 30 years or, or 80 years or whatever it is, that it's God's graciousness that says, it's okay, come on. It's okay. We've got, we've got all of eternity to partner together and to, and to see this remade as, as it talked about in the early parts of Genesis. And so I'm just so thankful personally, Marty, for what you're doing and even for how it's impacted me. And I know many others that I've talked to, but impacted me on making sure that I am cognizant of those balances, of those counterbalances, that it is God's grace that motivates my zeal and passion, not the other way around. And uh, I think that that cart and horses is imperative that we, that we get those in the right order. And I think for what I'm perceiving, so many people have been affected in such a positive way by what you're doing at Bema in that regard to, to, to make sure that we are couching 
our understanding of God and his grace in the appropriate ways, in the scriptural ways. So thank you for that. Do you have any other closing remarks or, um, or anything you want to mention to the audience on where they can go to continue to find more or any direction that you might give them on this journey? Yeah. So I just, uh, well, just closing comment on what you just said. I love that. If, uh, I think it's all going to hover around that idea of who we think God is. Like if it's, if we think we're depraved and God's angry, none of this Disney, Disney world doesn't work as a metaphor. None of the stuff we're talking about, like, nope, doesn't work. If that's who we think we are and who God is. If we think we are a broken, imperfect mess of duly natures, so to speak, as Paul will talk about it. And God loves us. Right. That changes everything. If God is just full of grace and just can't give out enough grace then we're probably okay to give grace to ourselves. We're probably okay to give grace to others. And then we, uh, so we find that. So just to echo that, I think that yes. that really does become everything. As far as finding me, um, lots of places you can find me and you can find me on Facebook. You can find Baymont Discipleship on Facebook. Um, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, we'll put all these links, I think, uh, John said in the description of the of the show there. Um, so you can you can find us in all those places. And that's where I can, I mean, we're always, we have the podcast, but we're trying to produce other cool resources and other things that people might be interested in. So I've got a YouTube channel I'm trying to do more and more with. And so whatever we can to uh, just allow people to know how they can access the conversation. We have no plans for world domination. My perspective is not for everybody. It shouldn't be. I'm simply one voice Hmm. at the table trying to add to the hopefully super diverse, colorful, complex communal Eucharist table conversation that we're all a part of. So this is not about like, this is the, this is the secret. This is the key. But if God wants to use bits and pieces to help people, that's great because it's that journey. It's that race that we're running. So if it's helpful, awesome. If it's not move on because if if somebody had a question that they wanted to follow up with you or ask something, or, or maybe someone else on your team on anything that they've heard here, where's the best to direct that? Probably from that website that we have at baymodiscipleship.com. There's a contact form that keeps it in the right uh, email inbox. I'm trying to expand my team. Uh, the email log definitely backs up and is crazy to try to keep up with these days because it goes directly to me at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I need to somehow do something with that because there's a lot of emails that come in. Right. So a little teaser, if you're interested in maybe helping Marty out with his administrative team, please reach out to him bamadiscipleship.com. Really appreciate everything you're doing, Marty. Thanks for being here with us. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you in the future. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, John.